Hello, everybody. So now I'll introduce three uh, dangerous people to you. Artists who um, have been called upon time and again to intervene in um, urban areas where things are not going as they should go. Uh, urban planning is being let loose on these areas. Uh, architects, politicians, developers uh, create high ambitions. But of course, there are the residents too to reckon with and these three artists are um, highly skilled in uh, maneuvering between all the parties involved, in bringing new life, regenerating urban areas. And um, these three artists are skilled in not just um, finding a place for art, their art or other people's art, in these, inside these urban areas, but also along the way um, commenting on the process, uh, interfering in the decision making and taking care of the participation for all those people who are very often forgotten in these processes. Three people I highly admire. I'll uh, introduce the first one now, Sabrina Lindemann, um, who has single-handedly been changing some neighborhoods in The Hague over the past few years here in Holland. Uh, Sabrina is an artist and an urban curator, as she calls herself, um, very often brings art into the neighborhood, into the public spaces, uh, into the existing structures, using spaces, using the people in the neighborhood uh, to, to uh, mobilize and co-create uh, surprising uses of the art uh, in order to, to open up an area and to uh, uh, create new initiatives. Sabrina Lindemann. Well, thank you for inviting me. In my presentation, existing public forms as a model for bringing back collectivity in urban renewal areas, I will talk about some projects the artist organization Mobile Office Optrek has realized in the period from 2002 to 2010 in Transvaal, a multi-ethnic neighborhood in The Hague, together with other experts from different disciplines such as the inhabitants and entrepreneurs of the neighborhood, but also architects, urban planners, and designers. Mobile Office Optrek is a nomadic initiative using empty dwellings as a base for the organization and realizing projects on the streets and in the neighborhood. The main question in the beginning was, which role art could play within urban transformation processes, other than being used as decoration? In which way could the specific expertise from the artist get a meaning within this context? As being an inhabitant in Transvaal, I have lived there for six years until my own house was broken down. And being an artist, I felt strongly involved in the radical transformation processes with trans which Transvaal is going through until 2014. As a result of the municipal restructuring plans in which a lot of in which a lot of the social housing will be demolished and mainly houses for sale are built back. With the program of art projects in public space, debates, interventions and research, we commended with our projects on the urban development plans, with which the municipality and the housing corporation did not only intend to improve the housing supply in the district, but also wanted to change the composition of the population. From the end of 2005, Optrek developed methods and tactics for the use of temporary vacant spaces, such as Hotel Transvaal, Stay in the Interim, I will speak later more about it, and through the laboratory of the Interim, the think tank from, hotel, from the hotel, established for the purpose to devise alternatives for the existing approach of area de uh, development. In our opinion, the traditional master planning had to come to an end in which this was normal to wipe out whole neighborhoods and creating a kind of tabula rasa. A new mindset was needed to develop from out the existing city using more a flexible planning process, process in which the qualities and potentials of the neighborhood could play a role. 
more kind of open source urbanism. We noticed in our long-term practice in Transvaal that it makes great impact to put in this context existing public forms to the test as a model for bringing back collectivity. Shared spaces in the public domain, such as the restaurant or a public garden, form a physical context for social practices, familiar territory for guests and visitors. Obtrek worked with this phenomenon in order to initiate collective behavior and interaction from a new perspective. I will now present you four examples of physical and cultural social spaces introduced by Obtrek in Transvaal, which became part of public life for a brief or more extended period. Um, the first example is uh, a series of debates uh, with the title The City Meets the Neighborhood. And it's a concept thought of Wochenklausur. It's a group from Austria. And the main aim in this project was building a bridge between the neighborhood and the culture city center. Uh, the observation from Wochenklausur was, when they uh, were invited by us, it's a very closed neighborhood. It's very introvert. So it's a, with, less of, with not a lot of uh, exchange between the city center and, and, uh, and that neighborhood. So, for example, also people I met or I know from that neighborhood, they always said, well, how can I learn Dutch if I don't see, actually, the Dutch people? And, but of course, it has to do with both sides, but that's a bit uh, characteristic of that neighborhood. Um, so with a series of debates, we tried to, to, yeah, to really build that bridge to um, yeah, getting exchanged and more kind of breathing um, ground. We transformed a, a Moroccan fish restaurant uh, for one day in a week, for four months, into a debating center in, in one of these buildings you just saw before. Um, and uh, while hanging up this red cloth in front of the fish, which is laying behind, resetting the tables a bit and uh, building up really the kind of panel. And the most important always was that one uh, person from the neighborhood was really also sitting in the panel as expert and sitting there as expert next to the other experts from other institutions which were invited uh, um, for that special theme was, was talked about. Um, the themes of the debates were very actual. It was things uh, which were in the newspaper in that time, uh, themes which were talked about uh, in a broad sense, and um, for example, rights for illegal people, black schools, um, the interpretation of the Quran. And um, this, the, 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 the other part which was very important was the moderator. We choose to invite either very known moderators from television. We work, for example, also together with Chris, Chris Grimberger and well, other moderators where we know they were very good. So to have these debates really on a good standard and also use it a bit as a kind of seduction actually to get people that they thought, well, I really like to see that person. And um, so it was a, yeah, one of the aspects also to, to create um, this kind of movement, people coming together. Um, a very important aspect also was that we, uh, from the beginning uh, uh, on, we set up this debating series together with two institutions, one uh, neighborhood association who had experiences uh, of um, organizing debates, and the other one was the Institute of, for Hidden Knowledge, an uh, uh, institution from the city center who also was organizing debates in the city center and um, well, collaborating with them and actually going through that whole process of uh, doing that whole series of four months. Um, of course, the aim was that they were, would go on with it afterwards. They could take it over and, uh, and this four months would become kind of regular uh, um, habit to go on with these uh, talks. But unfortunately, I must say that it did not work out. Another example I will show you is the Interact, the Facade Theatre. Um, it was a place where we also had our office. Um, and what you see, these green boards, uh, it's done by the housing corporation because people, if people left already, they close off the buildings uh, so that you cannot enter them anymore. And in that case, we, we got two flats uh, on top of each other. And the aim here was, on one hand, to transform the space into a place where people really think that they could do something with it, that they really would live, love to live there. Um, 
and the other aim was to create a space where it's not so clear, is it public or private, if, is it inside or is it outside. Uh, so we, what we did was we took out one floor and we uh, placed also this huge window you can see there in the front, um, taking out all the walls on the top so it was a very light and a bright space. And this physical aspect of experience space was, is a quite very important strategy also in our work, having projects which are really strong also in, in coming in and ma making immediately a kind of reaction uh, by people. So in that case it was uh, um, that we said we have a strong and intense program, we invite a lot of people, um, doing that in that space or outside, and, uh, and, and having immediately discussions also, because people immediately there came inside and it was always, wow, this is a great space, I really would love to live here. And it doesn't, didn't matter if it was somebody from the housing corporation or from the city council or whoever. So it was also, well, open up that debate from why is it necessary to break down these buildings if you can still really do a lot with it. This was the opening of the space. Uh, so here you see the public can stay really in the street. The, the building becomes uh, the, the podium, the theater, the platform. Um, and for half a year we really had this uh, very um, full program where people from the neighborhood could use the space, people from the city center. Um, there were music, there were poetries. Um, this was a Korean dance company who came to The Hague and also came to the neighborhood to show their um, program. Interesting here is also to say, of course, all these projects need permissions. Uh, in that case, we lost a lot of time because the permission was lost when we uh, uh, well, sent it in to the city council. Um, and it's very important because if you work in these temporarily interim spaces, in that case, we know we have like one year, maybe one and a half year to use a kind of space, but if you lose already half a year because of the procedure of the permission, then not so much time is left and very often that has also to influence your program. But in that case, we really said it doesn't matter. Also, if it's still one half a year, we just go and do it because the impact uh, we thought is so strong that we um, still will go for it. Another example is Café Moonrider, uh, um, thought of a Japanese artist we invited and he walked around and he thought he didn't felt very invited by these Turkish and Moroccan uh, coffee shops in the neighborhood. And then he thought, well, then he wanted to create a new space, but it had to be then a very extraordinary space um, where people could go in, but also would change their position because in that case they were lifted up into the air and um, really got literally a different perspective on their neighborhood. Uh, you could very well see the city center, maybe for the first time, because otherwise you're down on the ground and you don't have this orientation where you are, but you can suddenly see, oh, it's actually very close. Uh, you could see the seaside, you could see even Rotterdam. And um, what was also very nice or in interesting that young people immediately they start to search for their home, their school, uh, the shop where they very often go. So it really had this function of um, yeah, positioning, positioning yourself in a different way than if you would be on the ground. And the last example I will show you is Hotel Transvaal, lodging in the interim. Um, a very specific project because the, the, the projects I showed before, they were more on the short-term term basis, I would say. I mean, sometimes half a year, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. But with this project, we really wanted to stay much longer, let's say, on one place and with one project in the neighborhood to, to be able to really dig much more into the fabric of that neighborhood. And um, the specific thing was that we saw the massive uh, um, empty spaces in the neighborhood as the capital of the neighborhood. Not something to, to be close, closed up, but specifically to open up and to give it to the people so that they could use it. Um, in a way that it would also give an impulse on the neighborhood again, because now these neighborhoods very often are no-go areas, people don't dare to go there anymore, everything is empty. And we thought if you could vitalize these empty spaces in a way, then it 
really adds something to the neighborhood and it also brings back this neighborhood into the fabric of the city. So in that case, um, uh, we started up a hotel. Uh, you see there the, the reception in an old shop. Um, and the specific thing of this hotel was the rooms were not in one house or in one place, but the rooms were spread in the whole neighborhood. And they like say they popped up like mushrooms. If a building was broken down, then uh, another room popped up somewhere else. Um, we also included all the existing facilities in the neighborhood uh, in that hotel, of course, because a hotel needs facilities. So all the existing restaurants and uh, uh, bakeries and, sh and internet shops, they were part of that project. And people from the neighborhood could also work in the hotel. Um, we asked entrepreneurs from the neighborhood to design the rooms. So there was a Chinese room, an Indian room, and of course also some artists. It's a room with a guest. So you had to share the space with already existing guests and also finding some things of these guests, mysterious things. The palace room and the felt room, which was very specific because if you came inside, there were no furnitures and then you had to go and search for your furnitures. And if you found them, actually to taking them, you even uncovered actually traces again from the former inhabitants. Um, this is not very well good to see, but still enough. Um, this is kind of scheme of the hot hotel. So actually what you see, it's getting an horizontal hotel because the rooms are spread in the neighborhood. It's using the existing facilities. It's connecting the existing people who are there um, and binding them in that concept of the hotel. So it's creating in a, in a very smart way a, a new social network and I found always very special that suddenly the Turkish owner of the restaurant start to speak with the Moroccan owner of the fish restaurant, which sounds very normal, but it's not in these neighborhoods because the groups are very much divided. And, uh, and suddenly, because they all belong to the hotel, these bridges again uh, uh, um, no, came up to, to, well, to communicate with each other. Um, for me, also very specific was um, that um, in a hotel, the most important is actually the hospitality. And normally, these neighborhoods are um, mentioned in the newspaper as very negative places and uh, with a lot of problems. But suddenly, because calling it a hotel, you also said we have the biggest hotel of the world because in our hotel, the buses and the trams, they're running through the hallways of the hotel. <laughs> So with, the, with this kind of image, it was like, well, it's not about problems, but it's really about who is the guest, who is actually the host, and, and who are we welcoming in this place, and how can we do that in a way that it is so um, pleasant as possible. Well, that's some pictures from the facilities, of course. A Moroccan baker, internet, very important a real brown Dutch cafe, and of course also public space belongs to it. The idea for a hotel in Transvaal serves three important purposes. The physical re-evaluating of empty space, creating small social networks in an area where the existing fabric is falling apart, reflecting on the meaning of a period of demolition and developing a vision for local and national restructuring policy. Developing the hotel into a longer running concept gave rise to the major additional aspect of providing the district with an extra social, economic, and cultural boost. This initiative, a hotel, model, experiment, art project, and company in one, showed that areas in the midst of social, cultural, and economical transformation do have genuine potential. All the Optrack did its utmost to ensure the hotel's continuation such continuity in an area of transformation turned out to be particularly difficult to realize. It encountered a number of intervening factor, factors, most notable the particular dynamics of the slow moving planning process in districts such as Transvaal. Funding issues, facilitating the hotel with partners who have their own objectives and expectations. 
These circumstances conspired to bring about the closure of Hotel Transvaal earlier than expected. Um, in 2008, the financial and real estate crisis came uh, with the result that immediately there was a total building stop in the neighborhood, which meant that um, the buildings we were in, they were still broken down, but we did not, we were not able to get new empty buildings, also because the neighborhoods just stayed in their buildings, and uh, which was for them very positive and good, so in some ways you could say there was no necessity anymore for the hotel. Um, the second thing was that immediately actually with the crisis, um, the housing corporation withdraw their money. Um, after they had, uh, after very short after each other, two new directors, um, with the argument they didn't sell more dwellings because of this project. Um, and half a year later, because in that time in between, we still had a lot of discussions with each other, uh, the city council followed with the argument we would not create any more news value for them. So it is very clear in their eyes it was only a marketing instrument and they could not really appreciate the social and cultural and other values we created because they were not measurable. Um, a second, also another thing I think is very important to say, we had very close contact with these parties. Um, even one person was involved in the laboratory of the interim from this uh, housing corporation. And um, so they're very, they were very involved in this whole process of developing the project. And it showed me very much that single persons, they can have a vision or they can be far uh, further um, with their mind than a whole company. And, uh, and that makes these kind of projects very vulnerable because if this person is going away or suddenly you lose your, your basis or then um, it's very difficult to, to, to go on. The int intended economical impulse and the involvement of local residents and business therefore remained limited. But the hotel nevertheless emerged as a working model of urban curating and prompted a useful debate. The media response was impressive and the initiative resonates still in the art world and sparked interest among various Dutch local authorities and parties from the world of urban planning until the worlds of tourism, leisure and hospitality even, and even abroad. Different institutions or mun municipalities got inspired and started their own neighborhood hotel like in Groningen, Stay in Stad, or in Rotterdam, Kus and Slope, but both with a different attitude, shape and agenda. Through the financial and real estate crisis in 2008, the change in the tra traditional planning came unexpectedly quick. Municipalities focus now in the current situation on the so-called organic area development. Or what for me would mean that you develop much more from out the existing city, because the traditional master planning is not affordable anymore. I'm convinced that in this situation, artists, architects and designers can role a play in using their expertise and skills they developed in the last years and to show and practice through doing that different ways are possible because they experimented with alternative forms of living together, experimented with using alternative re resources and different programs to alternative creative social, to create social fields. They trained themselves to deal with the unexpected, to combine knowledge in multidisciplinary teams, taking initiative and giving advices even if they are not asked for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. We'll, we'll see you back on the stage after the next presentations. Uh, I think... Um, so the, the autonomous quality of Sabrina's work can't be contested. At the same time, you also gave some examples of how, um, how high the risk is of being instrumentalized by city marketing, by housing corporations aiming to sell more houses through your art. Uh, 
And that exactly is the topic for this session. So the autonomous or the instrumentalized, that is also uh, a question that Jeanne van Heeswijk faces ever since she started working on arts projects in uh, uh, urban space, urban housing, uh, uh, urban development areas. She's always creating new public meeting spaces or remodeling existing ones. She's done so um, very visible, very influential in different cities in Holland and abroad, uh, always including people, always participating uh, people, and always uh, playing, negotiating, fighting, and, and um, uh, maneuvering with the officials involved. Uh, for all of this, for her work in Holland, for her work abroad, uh, just a month ago she received the Leonor Annenberg Prize for Art and Social Change, and I think nobody deserved it more than you did. Jan van Heeswijk. Thank you for that compliment. Um, where do I click? Uh, sorry, can, can somebody help me out? No, I have to go back. Okay. All right. I'll leave this image because I want to, um, to first address uh, a few things. When I was invited to speak on this uh, conference, I was actually quite delighted as the topic uh, housing, uh, uh, the social is actually a topic uh, quite close to my heart. So, um, But when I found out I was speaking today, and not yesterday, I don't know why, I had Friday in my hat, and in this panel I was, shit, why? Uh, again, uh, to talk about this uh, juxtaposition between autonomous or instrumentalized. Uh, as actually, I don't care so much. I don't see it as a, uh, um, a, a dichotomy. I actually uh, like uh, being an instrument. Um, I like being an instrument that enables the right to produce your daily environment. I like being an instrument to work on self-organization, collective ownerships, and new forms of sociability. I like to be, an to be an instrument to occupy the place you live. Because the way the title is posed, it is always, uh, let's say, uh, presumed that there is an autonomous position and there is an instrumentalizing group, which is normally the government or social housing associations and stuff like that. But I think it's more important to me to think about how uh, can uh, I, as an artist, and the skills that I have, how can I put myself at work in uh, areas that are undergoing rapidly change and that are very const uh, that are in, in big trouble? So, uh, a little bit late, I titled my uh, lecture today, Use Me, But Not Abuse Me. <laughs> so, in a time of accelerated globalization and rapid change in our environment, where neighborhoods become sites of consultation, where different conditions of power are inscribed, where everything seems to be locked up by overregulation and populist images prevail, people are increasingly feeling de-invested and excluded from their daily environment. There is a serious disconnect between ordinary people and governmentality. Taking together, these things call into question traditional modes of artistic interventions in the city. Today, there is an urgent need for us, artists and other co-producers, to re-engage and witness the invisible factors of power that shape the territory and the faculty of publicness, to reorganize system of urban interaction and to challenge the political and economical frameworks. And economical frameworks, yeah, good point. <laughs> it's always a problem if you read the text. The question is, are we capable of creating a place and associated capacity of a public faculty, a public domain, where we can research, debate, phase up to the confrontation and address one another as co-producers of the city? Can we make this area of tension visible and develop instruments to enable interventions in that area in order to create models that allow for 
people to become participants in the process of visualizing the dynamics, complexity, and diversity in the city they live in, and collectively develop a narrative about the city in which everyone has a place? Can alliances between politics and art be imagined, tested, and based in practices that establish narratives for a democratic, post-national, and more inclusive society? A lot of very big questions. But then, how do you do that? How can you become an instrument uh, of change or an instrument for new forms of sociability? I often refer to for forms of urban architecture, hit and run tactics that allow the sensitive place in our society to emerge and block the relational energies to flow again. Developing instruments that enable us to fill in this place and to deepen, sharpen, or question its narrative. So, we can face our world in progress, not as consumers, but as creators. And we can become actors in our own surrounding again, being able to act up and to become active citizens. As I think it's quite hard for us that we sort of lost that ability. It seems to me that it's really important to ask how an engaged practice can address and mobilize the existing local physical and social cultural capital and use this as a performative basis for a city under development. So, for this, I think I had to develop the ability to step into the community and become part of the process uh, the community is undergoing myself, and to find out where to precisely to put my crea creative energy at work, at use, or how to put myself at work, as you could say it like that, in order to learn together how to take collective responsibility to make the information gathered uh, work significantly in both social and political contexts. So these processes are always long and sometimes very painful as we have to learn about each other's ideas and different viewpoints. It's a process of collective learning about how to unleash the potential of people to engaging with different creative energy for collective act action in order to become a shaping force in your own environment again. And for me, I think that's very important. And I just want to show a few uh, snippets of a few projects uh, where I think people uh, with whom I participated, communities uh, with whom I participated, and like uh, Sabrina, I, I always like to talk about experts on location, because if we talk about inhabitations, you inhabit somewhere too. You are also somewhere living. So I can be an inhabitant. I can be an artist. I can be a shopkeeper. So somebody with knowledge of place. Uh, as I would like to say it. And how these people uh, with whom I worked on place uh, actually saw me also as an instrument to, uh, uh, to uh, ask the right again uh, to the place that they were living. And I, I divided it in four very uh, short snippets. One is uh, to reclaim the right to the question about uh, what transformation your uh, neighborhood uh, is un needs to undergo. The second is the right uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the projection of happiness. And the other one is the right to the image of success. And also the right to the place to live or just basically to have a home. And these are all very important uh, uh, rights, uh, 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 you could say, uh, which need forms of occupation. So. In Facial World uh, was a, pro a project commissioned by the score, so that's why I thought I let's put it back on the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in an intense period of more than a year, youngsters worked very hard uh, to rewrite a brief and with that the design of their neighborhood park. This is in uh, Slotervaart in the area Maretica uh, talked uh, before in the Westelijke Townstede, so I thought that's also... Uh, of, uh, of interest. While the city, zone, uh, the city council wanted it to be uh, a quiet green zone, the young people went to really look for what the community wanted and needed. And they very actively advocated for a concept called uh, active green. Uh, active green in, in opposition to the uh, seeing green, the kijkgroen, uh, Maritia also mentioned. And they said it's green that allows for a lot of activities such as sports, play, and gathering for different generations and group. 
I think they used Facial World and uh, uh, the project we were, uh, we were doing together to actually uh, produce as many different viewpoints uh, to argue for the community need. And they very actively counter-argued some of the presumptions that uh, the city had uh, uh, made uh, for the development of that park. So there was a whole list of requirements which was based on a questionnaire hold uh, uh, with, uh, with the neighborhood. And um, a lot of uh, the things that came out of that questionnaire were formed the basis of the park. And one of the things was, and I, I think I, I, I quite often tell it, was that uh, it came out of uh, the questionnaires the city government ha held, is that the, city, that the, uh, the neighborhood needed uh, a lot of like, uh, beautiful green and uh, one activity which was a tennis uh, court. Uh, an uh, eight, uh, eight trajectory tennis court. Mm -hmm. Now you think like, who, what kind of qu questions have they been asking in a predominant Moroccan neighborhood to come up with that list of requirements? What did they actually ask? And then they showed uh, all the list uh, of all the, uh, of the questions they asked. And I think one of the things that one of the young people we work with very directly said, like, but these are not the right question. Who actually uh, devised those questions? Because I, I will tell you later, it turned out that a lot of mothers uh, talked about the fact that their, kin that their kids love playing tennis, but they mentioned table tennis. So, <laughs> which the, 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 the city government translated into a full-fledged uh, uh, gravel court. So it's also, it's, it's not only uh, what kind of answers can you come up collectively, but what kind of questions do we are. So the right to the question, I think, is a very important one. How can we inhabit again uh, the questions that people ask about our environment and also ask about our future? I think that's very important. Just some images, because I'll just go very quickly uh, through some of the images. I think the kids used it very, very actively to, uh, to come up with a whole new set of criteria uh, for this park. And one of the uh, students uh, that uh, worked on it uh, she had a certain point uh, said when she was leading a discussion on safety, uh, safety issues uh, among others, she said like, if I want my idea to be, um, to be chosen, uh, it, should I bring uh, during the first uh, public meeting, should I bring as much people as I can? I said, yeah, that's roughly how democracy works. If you bring a lot of people and they vote all for your proposal, it, you run the biggest chance it's... Uh, yeah it is, uh, how you say it, it's, it's going to be chosen. And she said, thank God, I have a big family. <laughs> Which I think was a very interesting uh, statement. And also, uh, she uh, took it uh, uh, by heart because the first public meeting, she brought 34 people, <laughs> all relative, relatives of her, to vote for her proposal, but to also fo vote for the fact that she had a different opinion about where her park goes. So these are some of the, uh, the images about the negotiation uh, of the final design. The park has just recently uh, been opened uh, after years of uh, fighting again with the city uh, about getting the ideas, uh, uh, the lab produced, the uh, urban lab produced to be realized and not to, through the process, be brought back to the original idea. So to have this, uh, these things, uh, these things um, realized and uh, the opening was actually done just three months ago by uh, the local health and sports counselor and he took this opportunity to, to launch his campaign to fight obesitas and praise the park because its contribution towards well-being which is high on his agenda and Samia one of the pupils from the first hour who was there whispered in the background uh, said sure like we didn't know what the community really needed and what I learned from them is that actually, if you can assist or be instrumental uh, to a, a community, to help a community to start articulate its own voice and its own aesthetics and help them to begin to self-organize, it becomes very quickly apparent what they know and what they really, really need. And I think that can help them or, uh, to uh, facilip facilitate uh, uh, a process that might uh, reshape uh, their world. So, very quickly, because I'm 20 minutes short, uh, the right to uh, the projection of happiness. I worked in a small community in Germany, uh, in the middle of one of the largest motorway intersections in a rural, uh, uh, rural industrial rural area in Germany. And I learned a lot there about a way in which small happiness can be a resistant force. 
In a time where the rural area wanted to put itself on the map as a creative metropole, they effectively, the people of Wertacker, effectively fought to retake an empty church so as to create a community center. And they had to fight it back from the, uh, uh, from the church. And uh, they came up with a plan which I thought was quite genius. They, they called it half a church is not a church. So they suggested to demolish half the church, keep the other half, uh, for it to not longer be a church, and for that uh, to be able to be uh, um, a community center. Together with them, we created a large table at which it was possible to see the whole village, to serve both as a council table, a beer garden, and most of all, as a place to publicize their ongoing fight to be recognized as a viable community and to be taken serious for that. Um, we are the Ruhrgebiet. We are people, and I quote this, we are people open to the world and principle acting in solidarity. We are the heartland of Europe par excellence. And you have to take us into account when you're dreaming up your creative metropole, which was the subtitle of uh, the cultural capital in the Ruhrgebiet was that it needed to be a creative capital. So it needed to be the new creative metropole of the Ruhrgebiet. And they said like, listen, it's very good, all your projections of, um, of uh, what will be the future happiness and the future life of this area, but you cannot do that without taking us in account. And we might not be uh, the person you had in mind while thinking about it, but we, we are the Ruhrgebiet. So they used me and the project very effectively for three months to keep advocating uh, their existence and to keep advocating the fact that they, they have a right uh, to the future of the Ruhrgebiet. Uh, as well. So. The Afrikaner district, something I'm still working uh, at, which you could say is the right to the image of success, uh, which the people there, uh, I think, learned me, but at the same time used me still and are still using me uh, to fight uh, the, the local city uh, council on a daily basis. The Afrikaner district was one of the first in the Netherlands with a population of mostly foreign origin. At the moment, it's uh, 89%. In the 1990s, the Rotterdam City Council started a major urban development scheme adjacent to the area. And while one architectural feature after the other rose up with the slogan, clean, whole, and safe, strict regulation were put in place and the economic activity in the Afrikaner district itself died out. In order for the Afrikaner district to survive the expansion of the creative city, Rotterdam in 2001 started uh, the whole uh, um, rhetorics of the creative city, and uh, to survive this expansion and to thrive from it, Freehouse actively challenged these new regulations imposed by the local government. And we did that in doing over 300 interventions over the course of a year small hit and run interventions. And I have to say that, that one of the biggest um, adventures of the area is that it has a, a fantastic day market. It has a market uh, on Wednesday and Saturday with over 300 people selling uh, all kinds of different uh, products from all over the world. But with this idea of the expansion of the Kop van Zuid and uh, all of the new middle class housing moving, the Afrikaner Wijk needed to be more clean and more uh, uh, more sophisticated and there was a lot of regulation put in place like I said in a way that cleansed uh, almost the whole uh, the whole neighborhood and the market and its activity died out and uh, on bad days the area uh, looks like uh, this but also the market slowly slowly uh, uh, started uh, to, to, uh, to, to disappear. So Frios helped to set up small skill based projects to regenerate the area and its market by improving products, market interactions, and social integration in order to retain its intimate local character and its cultural diversity. In collaborations with residents, artisans, artists, and designers, new sustainable infrastructures where different skills and knowledges were combined were created, such as a neighborhood workshop for making and designing clothes, a communal kitchen, uh, a neighborhood shop selling local products, and a small-scale delivery service. At present, uh, the, all the free house uh, neighborhood uh, collectives are offering uh, jobs uh, in the area to roughly 40, 45 people. So some of the images. And actually what we always did is that we created this collective working 
places where we combine skills of the various people uh, living in the neighborhood, not only offering them jobs, but also creating new products, which we then started selling on the market using the empty stalls. And from that, also slowly started taking over empty shops in the neighborhood. At, at present, we, we, we are just opening our third shop uh, in, the, in the neighborhood run by a, a local, uh, a local uh, person just some images, and everything we do, we bring back to the market, we bring back to public space to demonstrate the skills and the qualities that exist in the area, of which maybe uh, a lot of people uh, at first didn't think uh, they were of interest for the developing of the city. But I think what is most important is that through radicalizing the local production, people together created a different image of success, and they showed very uh, strongly that a skill-based city can be a viable alternative to a creative city. They actually used free house and still use free house to tell that there is an other uh, image of what is a successful economical uh, uh, product or a successful economical neighborhood. And then just to close down in the last 15 uh, uh, seconds is that I'm just currently working uh, in Liverpool uh, to something so simple as the fact that sometimes it's also the right to live, to live well, and the right to basically a house. And um, as I'm in the middle of the project uh, for a year now, it's always hard to say something about it, but because it's really dealing with social housing, I felt to, uh, to, to, to at least bring it uh, uh, here. Uh, this is Anfield in, uh, in Liverpool, and these are uh, the classical two ups, two downs, uh, which, which you could say is a form of, uh, of social housing, which uh, they are, uh, uh, are demolishing and are, are boarded up uh, in the area. This is the map of the regeneration of the Anfield, uh, Brackfield area. And funnily enough, the red is everything that stays, the rest is everything that's, that's going, and the colors are colors of faces, and they decided to not use red for demolishing because that makes people so depressed. So if you are in yellow and blue, you are going to be demolished. Brown, you're also going to be demolished. Red, you are in what they call a buffer zone. That means that that's a zone for temporary housing, and then you're moved out. So it's just interesting. And it all has to do with uh, this fantastic stadium, the Liverpool Football Stadium, uh, which some years ago thought it wanted to expand. And because it wanted to expand, uh, the city thought that it had to gentrify the whole neighborhood. And they started this process at demolishing and moving people out very effectively, also implanting stories of being a bad neighborhood, a dangerous neighborhood, a neighborhood that, uh, with fires, with drugs abuse, you know, there's a whole image coming with it uh, of that it's very good that this neighborhood is, is changing. And in the process over the last years, of course, we all know the crisis stopped almost everything, and especially the whole uh, regeneration process in Enfield, Brackfield is put to a hole. So most of the, the image you saw before with all the boarded up houses is there already for four years, and it will be there for another uh, four years, at least maybe even long, longer. And uh, this is not one house or one street, this is just a whole area, it's looking like that. And individually there are still people living uh, in it. And it's also the scoreboard of the, of the football station that people used, which are always like, it's nine to six, uh, uh, the people versus the uh, investors. And they are called, uh, it's all about rape, murder, and, uh, and uh, being abused uh, in a negative way for uh, the future uh, of the development of the football stadium. So what we are presently doing is, we are the happy owners of a block of houses, uh, uh, because I think owning uh, was said before, like everybody's about, oh, we should not talk about property anymore, about ownership, but I think in a lot of uh, situations, it's not only the right to occupy your image of success or to the right to be able to create the questions that are asked about your future, but sometimes also the right to just own something, to be, in, to, to be entitled to uh, property or to own uh, ownership can be very important. And we very hard fought to uh, get these properties and we're using the old
whole bakery at the moment as a, a base to work with young people in the area and their families that are still there to basically uh, break open some of the houses and start rebuilding, remodeling, just build their own house. Just take the right back to live and to live well and to not wait uh, for processes uh, to uh, be put uh, uh, on to put above their hand and the people uh, we're taking them to learning uh, what design process is to very uh, uh, basic skills learning how to actually uh, um, uh, build your own house uh, and use those skills to uh, to renovate those old uh, properties and to start inhabiting them with uh, uh, with uh, with your families so i think what is very in, uh, important is for my practice, like I said, becoming part of a community and being part of the whole process of change in neighborhoods undergoing is key. Learning how at a deeper level we can face today's broker relations between people, culture and political process. To take collectively responsibility, to learn from each other how to produce change can make it possible that processes started work in a larger political, uh, social political context as well. Encouraging people to make in their territory, an environment in which they can create, produce, disseminate, distribute, and have access to their own cultural expression. So that the energy generated through people acting out in their own environment can lead to a network of support, a critical reading of one's own surrounding, and an involvement in the changes that take place. Finding ways to reset the public values of the arch, its public faculty, as a contributor to greater solidarity. And for this, you need to continuously go back again and again, to create an understanding of public domain as a shared space, as a space everybody can contribute and change. And I'm happy to be instrumentalized for that. Thank you. Jana, thank you so much. So, yes, uh, it's good to be instrumentalized as long as it's by the right people and for the right cause. Uh, mm, we will talk about that. Uh, in the meantime, while laptops are being changed, I'll introduce you to Roman Vasseur. Uh, he's based in London and he's very much part of a, of a critical and theoretical artistical discourse on art, public space, urban housing, urban... Uh, development renovation. Um, very different places he teaches um, around Great Britain and abroad. Uh, and over the past few years he held the role of the lead artist for Harlow Newtown. Uh, a very wonderful place which we will see probably uh, in his presentation. Um, Post-war it was designed to carry its independence by uh, including a large number of public art works by Moore, Hepworth, Chadwick and others. Uh, this by Roman Vasseur is, uh, is something he has radically changed around, including all possible parties, instrumentalizing himself on demand or not demand. And Roman, are you ready to do the yeah, presentation? That's, that's Very good, go ahead. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, I thought it was very interesting two previous talks to this, so <clears throat> hoping some of the issues can be uh, developed in discussion afterwards. But um, just some real some thoughts really about um, the images yesterday. I was saying that when I got to the end of yesterday, I felt like I'd been um, assaulted by the social in some way, and I kind of had a, a sort of throwing up of the social onto me. Um, and in a, on another sense, well, I think there's another discussion at the end of today, yesterday, about there maybe being not very much art talked about. But in actual fact, I think there was a degree of um, doing of art or craft uh, with images of the social. So we saw a lot of repetition of um, gatherings of people and people doing things together. Um, and perhaps that is a kind of uh, craft. Perhaps that is something that um, a kind of invoking of the public as a kind of material fiction. Um, also as a fact as well, but sometimes, particularly in these circumstances, as a, as a kind of forceful rhetoric. Um, and so I was left feeling with a sense of the public our, or community 
and um, the sovereign subject as kind of um, contingent uh, specters within the room in some way. So it's that which provides, I think, a link with uh, the project that I want to talk about, which is um, Let Us Pray for Those Now Residing in the Designated Area, <clears throat> which is, um, was a role that I took for a town, a new town in Harlow, Essex, which is east of London, about 40 minutes um, train ride out from Liverpool Street Station on the way to Stansted. Um, uh, designed and built uh, by Sir Frederick Gibbard um, in the post-war period, 1947 onwards. Um, and the role that I took uh, was threefold, really. Uh, one was to be something called a lead artist, which you might think of as being uh, similar to an artist placement group, Barbara Stavini, uh, John Latham kind of role, uh, a sort of incidental person there to provide a different reading of the set of circumstances that you have before you, um, but more specifically in this situation, to be a non-public facing role. So in other words, to sign a confidentiality agreement, to be instrumentalized within the confines of the agreement, um, and to work directly with partners, developers, and be part of the um, selection process uh, of uh, picking what was called a development partner for the uh, remaster planning and regeneration of an 80,000 population town, starting with the center of the town on a 200 million pound um, development of that center. Um, now, the thing that's very peculiar about this town is that it is, uh, or it was considered by its architect to be a total artwork. So in other words, it is um, the progenitor of an art and, re art and regeneration. It is a revisiting of an art and regeneration project. So one could think about the role of being lead artist, um, and the other aspect of that role was to curate some small projects, make some work, and also uh, provide a strategy document for, um, for public art commissioning um, in the long term. Um, but to think about it as a kind of process of appropriation of something that was considered a gesamt Gunstwerk already. Um, so Sir Frederick Gibbard, who was responsible for designing um, the mosque in Regent's Park, uh, bits of uh, Heathrow Airport, which were considered and commented by J.G. Ballard as being the last remnants of the Festival of Britain. And I think that's very true, actually. I think um, Heathrow does express the technological aspirations of the Festival of Britain. The Festival of Britain being a national project of which Harlow was one of the exhibitions. So it is a scopic project, it is an ocular um, thing, this town. It is something designed around uh, artworks and centered around artworks. Um, so, for example, uh, the landscape is designed <clears throat> around the notions of the picturesque based on Claude Lorraine paintings. Um, Frederick Gibbard was a very good friend of Henry Moore, whose studio was nearby, John Nash, um, uh, Barbara Hepworth, so pieces of work that were in the Festival of Britain came from the Festival of Britain and were transplanted into the environments of uh, Harlow Newtown. But the one thing, uh, sorry, this is the problem that everybody's had, um, text. Uh, this title is taken directly from a prayer of intercession that was written for the town in 1948, I think it's 1948, um, that is um, a mixture, a bizarre mixture of bureaucracy and theology. Um, so if I just read you a, and I think in a way it acts as a precursor to um, the recent phenomenon of regeneration. So although it seems to be an appeal to God, in fact, it is a very thinly disguised appeal to a kind of liberal social body. So if I just read you um, one of the passages, you don't have to get on your knees. Um, our Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come unto thee. Let us pray for all those who are designing this town that they may plan with boldness and sympathy. For the engineers that they may surmount all obstacles to supply the needs of the town and to bring to it all that may contribute to the amenities of the people. For the builders that they take pride in their work and may be induced with strength of hand and integrity of purpose. And it goes on and on and on like that. So I think there is a theology there which um, 
just referring to what I was saying earlier on about the specter of community and a kind of sovereign subject, um, what's very particular about Gibbard's design uh, for the town is that it places the sovereign subject at the center of its design and the center of its thinking. So in other words, uh, it has the biggest collection of um, post-war uh, civic sculpture in the UK, including works like this one uh, by Chadwick and this one by Barbara Hepworth, which is in a housing, um, a small sort of uh, grouping of housing, and was originally meant to go back into the middle of the town, but um, that community who live near to the sculpture now will not let it go into the middle of the town, much to Hepworth's um, disappointment uh, before her death. death. <clears throat> so, um, in many ways, it is a success story about the way that um, artworks operate to build community, and the references that Gibbard builds up to produce this design uh, are very English in the way that they are put together, although there are many Dutch um, references as well, and many Scandinavian ones. So Gibbard's modernism is, of course, a modernism of its period. It's a mixture of neoclassicism and also of um, modernism, but a kind of regulated modernism, uh, a one that kind of tries to um, evacuate the kind of uh, what Michael Bracewell's called uh, not too rec uh, sort of recently a cosmic cynicism, uh, or a sort of um, maybe the sort of Dionysian aspect of modernism. So that it's very therapeutic, it's very healthy. Um, it, uh, it provides sort of spaces, very scripted spaces for performing out democracy. So the references for that from Gibbard are the Italian nation state. And Gibbard talks about the fine, producing a sort of fine city. And used to make trips with Geoffrey Jellicoe, a very famous landscape architect, to Italy. So it is a very Oxbridge idea of what the city will be with artisans and people populating that picture of democracy. So, um, but on the other hand, it's a very singular vision and it worked at the time. Obviously now that's very much changed and uh, what you see and what I've tended to call it is uh, a series of spaces, a Jurassic Park of fossilized policy. So that in other words, what you have are these objects, which we know to be sculpture because they sit on plinths, they're weird. <laughs> so therefore, they must be art. They must be expressive. They must be um, coming from an individual's language, uh, which you may not understand, but um, you allow that certain space for somebody to be expressive, to be personal. Um, and so therefore, it demarcates itself from being a uh, national socialist in that way by putting forward the individual as the kind of, um, as that sort of mythological uh, body through which the project goes. So, um, so, this, so these things did work. These people did assemble around these objects. People did refer to these objects as things that um, announced the project. Um, and this is why I asked the question from Jean June yesterday about the experiment, about living in an experiment, and the excitement of living in an experiment. So this was mainly for a working class population and uh, sort of 20% uh, professional population moved out of the East End of London after the war. Uh, some of the influence of um, Ebenezer, the Garden City, um, but mainly based on the idea of um, the village. So for example, you have a center, a citadel center, uh, a sort of Italian state center with its kind of mock uh, Florentine squares. Um, and then you have uh, outlying village areas, each with their own health centers. And this town was responsible for introducing health centers into the UK, and also small sub-libraries, um, small shopping areas. And they were called hatches. Each pub was named after a butterfly because the person that designed the pubs happened to be into butterflies. So, and, the, and partly the reason I mention that is because uh, one gets a sense that you are, and uh, the reason that I did this project is because um, I'd visited Gibbard's house in the 1980s, and his house is on the edge of the town. And um, the, the models for the town are in the house, and you get a sense that you have this spectral view, this kind of aerial view of the town uh, that Gibbard perhaps had. And what you're walking through 
is a set of um, ecstatically imagined spaces or ecstatically imagined transcendental idea of democracy in a way that Gibbard imagined for those people in the population. So um, these are the housing types and really it is the the model village, it is the English village, the Scand or low-lying kind of Scandinavian uh, type of modernism that Gibbard sort of introduces, but also brings in very young architects like Cadbury Brown that was responsible for the Royal College of Art building. Some of these people were only 24 years old when they built these buildings, which is astounding, or designed these buildings, which is astounding to think about now. Um, so there is an extremely exciting and very romantic aspect, and uh, I suppose I'm displaying an attachment to the whole project, and I do. Um, but obviously there are, there are certain issues, and this is a real building, not a model. Um, but I think that um, what I was saying earlier on about um, it being scripted spaces, that there is no room in those um, places for those Dionysian moments um, of temporary inversions of laws in order to recreate laws or renew laws. Um, and I think it's very, probably very dangerous now to think about um, uh, the Dionysian as being outside of something. So in other words, uh, we had to sort of think about the small commissions that were done as being, uh, as occupying, really occupying the project of Harlow. And thinking of the project of Harlow is really as a series of images. And this is kind of what I want to make an argument for is that, um, is an argument for the image, is an argument for the image as having um, a sort of potency and effect and being very material in the way that it brings communities around it or it helps people not to be close to each other physically but to do what the designer for Milton Keynes uh, suggested was community without propinquity. So perhaps without closeness. So perhaps what Harlow does, even though it doesn't mold itself and design itself around technology in the car, which Milton Keynes did, it does prefigure an idea of the image as having um, a sort of a, a way of producing a, a binding argument, element or sort of coagulating uh, relationships. So um, we produced uh, this building as a kind of nervous breakdown of the images of Harlow um, and situated it in the main square, which was the square that was kind of felt to be um, the sort of high point or the expression of what Harlow could be in terms of um, reintroducing a kind of public space. And um, ostensibly it was an institution, it was a gallery or a museum. Um, but we did very little to announce it. We, um, we thought of it more as being, um, as I say, something, an object that intervened on the space in a very or a very juvenile architecture. Um, and acting in the same way, and I'll get to this in a minute, um, we found out that Clockwork Orange was filmed, quite a lot of Clockwork Orange was filmed in the town. And thought of the building as a kind of the protagonist of a clockwork orange, as Alex, as the person that takes Gibbard's neoclassical modernist logic to its very extreme, to its apogee, to this kind of hysteria in a way, to this sort of violent rearrangement of images and objects and actions in those spaces. So uh, we call this um, uh, tiny building uh, Harlow Temple of Utopias. Um, so it was a sort of Mount Olympus of, um, of Harlow's images. And installed was um, a video that we commissioned uh, from an artist called Amanda Beach uh, called Statecraft, um, of which I'm gonna show you about three minutes. Um, but the video is normally 11 minutes long. Um, it, is, it was filmed on an estate called the Bishopsfield Estate, uh, which was the image that I showed you earlier on, which is normally called the Casbah. And Sir Frederick Gibbard's house, and what it attempts to do through those two settings is talk about a, a private vision made public, so, um, which is Gibbard's vision. Um, 
but also the video, what the video does is it samples from a number of text sources, including, um, so it's a mashup of narratives, uh, James L. Roy, Harlow Council, Mission Statement for Art in the Community, CSI Miami, and the writings of economists such as Frederick Hayek and Alan Greenspan. So it talks about the politics of this kind of state building as a noir thriller. So if we can just get the lights down and... bit of techno you've got today anyway. Um, how am I doing for time? Five minutes, Five minutes? okay. Um, I can't show you everything, but the, uh, the second project I want to show you, uh, which I think adds to the sort of Baroque quality of the commissions that we did, um, or representation really of the modernism of Gibbard's design as a Baroque, um, was a series of performances by an artist called Wayne Lloyd, um, otherwise known as Wayne Winner, um, which were called Newtown, N-U, Town. Um, which were three performances in a comic. Um, each performance uh, carried out in the town was a retelling, redrawing, remapping of three films that dealt with architecture. Um, so one was A Clockwork Orange, one was Mon Oncle, and the third was The Fountainhead. Um, so each one obviously deals with architecture, but The Clockwork Orange in particular, finding out that it uh, was filmed in Harlow, <clears throat> So then reinstalling it as a kind of folklore back into the town, I think really enabled us to think about um, the public and private in a very different way in order through the kind of violence that's displayed in the film or the violence that's very much indulged in the film, think about the ways that um, those spaces are kind of broken apart symbolically. So let me just get...
get the lights down again, that'd be good. obviously the money that he makes from raping and pillaging at various suburban houses around about London. So obviously he wants to get in there as quickly as possible so that he can collect his booty and have some really good violence. So he knocks on the door. And the, there's an author in there and he's writing a book called A Clockwork Orange and he's typing away, his name's Mr. Alexander and Mrs. Alexander is there and he says, there's something in the door, darling. He's an author. There's <laughs> something in the door, darling. Could you see who it is going now? Hello. Hello, Mrs. I've had a terrible accident. I've had a terrible accident in the bottom of my leg and my foot's come off. And she goes, oh, darling, there's a man here who says he's had a terrible accident. Mr. Alexander says, my goodness, I think you better let him in. And as soon as Mrs. Alexander opens the door, Alex and his droops pour in, all wearing masks with very big phallic noses on them so they can't be recognised. Mr. Alexander and Mr. Alexander have a clue who they are. All they know is that it's one of the ultraviolence gangs. They can tell that because they all wear the same clothes. They wear white, baggy white things that look a bit like old underwear pyjamas things, and they wear cricket boxes, and they wear bowler hats, and some of them wear makeup. Alex's eye is the best piece of makeup there is. Now, let's have a drawing of this house before we go any further. This is a particularly nice one. It's like this. Now, the glass is particularly nice because it's ultraviolet. Now, what that does, it does two things really. It stops your furniture fading when it gets sunny. Which, no, you may laugh, but it's worth every penny, okay? <laughs> and the other thing, the other, the other thing about it is that, obviously, it, um, it, has a certain, it has a certain reflective tint on it, a bit like oil, which, which looks particularly nice on a sunny day. And uh, let's just do that there. And actually, there's a little Japanese bridge as well, which I thought was a lovely touch. There we go. And up the top, just small minimal windows. You don't need much for now when you're up there. That's the bad thing. The tiny one. Okay. So that's house number one. Back to the house. Mr. Alexander is in a wheelchair. He's never been able to walk particularly well. Um, he's, he's not been a well man over the years. Um, but um, the good thing about wheelchairs um, are that when you grab hold of somebody by the hair and pull them out, they fall so well and they make the most tremendous clatter. You can pick them up and you can bang the wheelchair over the head of the crippled person. That's exactly what Alex does. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's enough ultraviolence. Um, Okay, just to get very quickly to, um, to the final kind of strategy bit. Okay, the problem um, in the short time I've got, the problem with, um, I think, many of these kind of lead artist roles, certainly of late, is that there's a certain amount of retrofitting done. And, and I'm, that's been my experience of public art projects over many years, is that uh, one arrives with a great deal of optimism and then has to do a massive amount of work in terms of retrofitting the situation in terms of the contracts, uh, and actually, the kinds of economics that are involved that give rise to the forms of governance that happen out of these situations. So no matter how hard the, the artwork tries to produce better forms of governance, um, of course, the kinds of transaction exchanges, market-led exchanges, particularly in the UK, that are in place produce the dominant form of um, governance. So... Um, so a lot of my time was spent trying to retrofit that situation, including um, not being able to select an architect, um, but also thinking about um, opportunities for um, assembly and access onto the areas of public, uh, public arena um, that were being talked about in the town centre. So the idea was that um, 
Because the sculptures that populate the town centre are owned by a trust and cannot be touched on by the um, developers, uh, I decided to propose an idea that used uh, the Palm Springs model for selling off the reservation, um, which I thought was ingenious um, of them, not me. But um, they, um, there was an idea that when Palm Springs uh, reservation was sold off, that rather than sell a large block of the land, you divided the land up into checkerboard parcels uh, and then sold off every alternate block size parcel. So no one de developer or uh, property owner can buy a large block of land without it being on a corner to corner arrangement. So hence Palm Springs uh, development is very li low lying. But what that also does is that it means that you spread your sphere of influence like a net over the site. So if you think of the sculptures being in every black square, it's possible to have influence over the whole site by combining the contracts for the plinth, and think of the plinth in an expanded term for each sculpture. So each plinth will be designed with uh, an artist do, doing that design in collaboration with a landscape architect and for that contract to be uh, answerable to the main client and not to the developer. So um, it's a way of sort of re or disinterring the modernism of Gib Gibbard and re, um, re radicalizing it and producing it as a kind of uncanny in those spaces um, as something that you kind of know, but you actually also um, feel very unfamiliar with, um, but also as a way of owning those spaces again. So, I think that the project as a way, the uh, project ha holds many kind of questions, but it underlines a problem of both representation of community and the social, and also of a kind of this deployment of a sovereign subject within these arrangements as well. But uh, underlying this, and I have to kind of stress this, and I think it was interesting in the last presentation that the idea of land ownership is brought up, and I agree with Patrick Keeler on this, is that it's land values that are almost at the core of the problem. If the land didn't cost so much, the buildings would be better. You and I could get hold of the land. Uh, it follows. This, this is, this is a, just a fundamental problem. And I remember Linda Morris doing a talk at the ICA about the Tate modern being uh, the kind of vanguard of property development in London in the 1990s. And why didn't the Arts Council buy property? And I have to agree with her. Why did the Arts Council never buy property? Should have done it. Anyway, that's the end. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So, uh, here's microphones for all of us. Okay, so we have, we have just about, uh, sit wherever you like, uh, we have just about 10 minutes to, to continue on these um, three important presentations and to uh, give you the opportunity to ask something. Just one, just one, one question to you, Roman. Um, did I detect in your presentation a kind of criticism of the work by Jana and Sabrina and, and Maria Tizza this morning in the sense that you say, uh, um, you're, you're holding an argument for the image as opposed to community getting together um, artists who, who are always stressing the, the, the necessity of bringing people together. No, I mean, I'm not... Um, that's not to the exclusion of other, other activities, but it, it's, um, it's perhaps uh, just that the image is sometimes viewed with some... And, yeah, that's viewed with some suspicion sometimes, mm. that, um, that to engage with one another is something more reliable, more mm. ethical, yeah. and that the image is perhaps something that's less ethical. Mm -hmm. So, um, in these types of yeah. arrangements. Yeah. But of course, they are, it's something that is very dominant in the arrangements. So, for example, when uh, we were having meetings for, uh, to select a developer, um, uh, you know, graphics were used for the tendering process. Mm. Uh, Fly-throughs, you know, uh, those kinds of um, CGI fly-throughs were used, yeah. um, which are highly pornographic, highly mm. pornographic mm. in the way that they kind of 
bring uh, uh, you know um, partners into the project. Yeah. Um, this kind of imagining, really, of what this super clean, you know, metrosexual populated space mm. is going to be. Um, but still, it has effect. Yeah. Jeanne, could you comment on that? Rowan might have a point there. That in all the work you and, and, all, and a lot of people here is doing, the, 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 the value of the image might become underestimated. Um. No, I would disagree, disagree with that, but then, because then we have to start a discussion on specify the image. Because sure. I think, in in my work, I, I always say that I, I I use my my skills as an artist to enable other people to recreate an image and a different understanding or a different imagination of the place where they are. So I think that. Uh, the same question, autonomous or instrumentalized, we can also use for the image, you yeah. know. And I think the image is very decisive when it comes to processes of citizenships. So I think we also have to rethink uh, what we do with the image yeah. uh, as such. Is that an image that is an inclusive image, that have other people also the right uh, to, uh, uh, to, co to co produce, or is the image something that's the sole right to an artist or to a designer? I mean, these are also questions. So, and then, yes, you could say that what we do quite often in, in a presentation is not making the difference uh, when we show images uh, between an image of a gathering and an image w which works as an image itself. Yeah. So, that confusion yeah. I can understand. Yeah. And also that uh, sometimes. It shows how hard it is to uh, to create uh, images, to g more participatory, if you want, images, uh, and making it strong images. Okay, it's. I think it's it's a vital thing to to remind us all of when we're talking about the social all the time. One other question, one other essential thing that you just finished your presentation with, Sabrina might be true that all the work that you're doing, that all the people here are doing, uh, will always, in the end, feel um, marginalized or fail because of the matter of the land value. You will never be able to, to be the strongest party in that. Well, that's true. For instance, <laughs> your, your, for instance your hotel. Yeah. You might say that the hotel is a brilliant idea, I slept it in a few times, I loved it, uh, a lot of people are attracted to the idea, but in the end, that too is a project bound to disappear because of questions of land value. Now I must immediately think of a proposal Hans Fenhuizen did in the laboratory of the interim, mm -hmm. uh, where he especially pointed out that subject, he said actually if you really want to take, uh, to play a role in that game, mm. then you have to buy to own, to own, yeah, like, well, like Jana own says, the building, or mm -hmm. I mean, then you become a strong yeah. partner with, yeah. within that field of, uh, yeah. 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 Now you, more than anybody else, is stressing the fact that the the in between time, the the interim time, is also a place where you can do very very valuable stuff, and create long term have long term effects as well. But still, this ownership, Jana, I, I found it sort of uh, almost emotional when you showed us the pictures from Liverpool, the Anfield area, when, when you said, yes, all these rights, we need to have them in place, but the right to own a dwelling is, is always going to be essential. I, th I think yes, and in this specific case, uh, like you all said, because a lot of things at the moment very much uh, circle around uh, uh, land, land value and, 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 and property value. So uh, I, th I think there is a lot of different skills uh, in which you can sort of like uh, tr try to focus or, or try to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to find a way to, to intervene. Mm. But in this particular case, uh, um, where um, the, the site is so much used for speculation, I think in any way to do anything there, it means by taking matters in, 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 in your own hand there, literally means to, to, take, to make sure that you become an owner again. Yeah. In, that, in that sense that, that, that you can maybe uh, make some of that property again uh, uh, private.
instead of in, in what's so-called pro, pro, public as in social housing, but it's of large corporations and uh, smaller scale initiatives of group of people that co-own uh, a group of houses can be a very, uh, very important, uh, very important tool uh, uh, in that specific uh, specific area. So I'm looking a lot, a lot into that the right to own a house, you know, or to the right to well, to well, to well living, and uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not easy. All of all of this, I think, comments to what we heard uh, this morning earlier by Yazid, Anani, and and Zoran Erich. The the um, Zoran talked about the urban feudalism, and Yazid talked about the the mega projects in Ramallah and the fragmentation that it leads to. Um, all your practices are kind of counter to that. Who would like to ask a question, comment from the audience? I'll I'll come over with the. Microphone. Uh, could you stand up so everyone can see you? Hello. Um, Raymond, I just wanted to ask you about the video that you showed in your, what was it called, your Utopia. And I thought it was quite sinister, the, the movement of the video. It reminded me a bit of that Channel 4 Ident where it follows around the estate. And I, I was just wondering what the response to that video was from the people, the residents that, that watched it. Um. Good question. Yeah, it was, um, it was very mixed. Um, and there was some upset. Um, and then there was some making up. Uh, but there was also um, some very interesting conversations that came out of it, which um, was the point, really, that I, I always wanted there to be a degree of argument rather than uh, agreement, I suppose. And for there to, be, to, for there to arise um, different segments or different kind of interest groups or different, gr different groups that had different interpretations or different ways of believing in the project of Harlow. So therefore there were some people that saw, it, and that is Harlow's problem and many Newtown's problem, is that it's a kind of modernism in stasis. It would like to be completely pristine, but of course it can't be. It can't be modern forever. So um, although I very much, you know, I felt for those people, other people came back and said, you know, well, actually, to those people that were hurt by it, we said, actually, you don't understand. You don't. So, there, so actually, kind of, I think a sort of more meaningful conversation came out of that. I think they understood that there was a sort of political drama behind it, of which they were all, everybody was involved in. And um, perhaps maybe even to understand a sort of transcendental nature of that, you know, or sort of aspiration of that. And um, I think that was very important in terms of understanding it as modernism as heritage. So, yeah. Andrea, you wanted to ask something. Yes. Stand up so, oh. so people can see you. I, I have a microphone. They know. Oh, oh, yeah, you, you have your own, no? <laughs> I have my own. Yeah, I have my own. Um, <laughs> That's why I come down, because I'm feeling good. Um, I, I can't let slip this question of ownership, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that, um, that, that, that quite extraordinarily, the three of you seem to have settled upon this kind of problem of recuperation of ownership as a mechanism why, whereby one understands um, the uh, acquisition of power. And I think, of course, that is a normative understanding of how, power, how, we, how we regain power. And of course, I also think this might be quite interesting in, in relationship to what might come up in the second panel discussion today, um, in relationship to ways in which um, space might be utilized. But I, I wondered really whether you seriously propose that the, um, the alternation of, a cons a, a, of the basis of a problematic of social housing being that um, it is all based on capital monetized ownership, mm -hmm. that the thing that we need to do is beat them at their own game by buying back. You're, of course, you're, you're English and you're eloquent and polite, but actually, actually I, I, you're, I you're, quite you're troubled. You're troubled by, yeah. by the emphasis they're, they're putting on the ownership. I'm interested in it. Playing, playing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. She's, We're interested in it. Okay, Andrea, who co-organized this whole thing, is she says she's interested. <laughs> she's actually furious. Because we're all trying to escape from this neoliberal economy stuff, and now you're saying we have to play them at their own game. But I think there may be new ways of, of becoming an owner. Um, I think then more in the way of corporations, for example. I mean, that you don't 
own it on yourself, but you own it with a group, for example. And I think in that way, I really see some perspectives for the future. Okay, just short, short replies, because I agree, I'm kidding, but, but this is very, very essential, what, what you're touching yeah, upon. Yeah, yeah. Roman? I mean, I, yeah, okay, I understand the problem, because I mean, with regard to talking about a feudal uh, structure, you know, the, you know, the 80s, you know, I did a lecture on uh, Rocky, the boxing movie the other day, which is a fantastic sequence, which leads on to the whole uh, dispute about the Rocky sculpture on the steps of the Philadelphia Museum. Uh, which is the one where he goes from a feudal space in the city running, going da da, and then he climbs the steps towards this kind of monument, towards this kind of property owning structure. So, therefore, owning property in that kind of paradigm is the kind of ultimate dream in many respects. But I, I think maybe, I, I mean, I'm certainly talking from an experience of just entirely uh, just being in a situation where where is your leverage? So, it is at that particular point of time. So, and if it's land and, you know, God's not making any more, but the Dutch are, but, you know, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it is that problem. It is a, you know, so therefore, if you, it, it is a question, at some point it becomes a physical question. At some mm -hmm. point it becomes a material, okay. physical question of blocking something. Finally, Jeanne. No, I think, I think it's, if, if you talk about, um, um, let's say, uh, spatial rearrangements or, or rethinking the use of space, then, it's, then, then you have to think on all the different uh, things, on, on the legal situation that determines the uh, way uh, space is used or, or designed or, 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 or possible occupied, but it's also uh, the way uh, uh, ownerships uh, functions with that. And it's not beating them at their own game, but it is maybe trying to make an, uh, your, your own game. Mm. Uh, because now mm. you're, just an, an act, you're just a passive uh, consumer uh, of uh, even in social housing of a policy that's put upon you and you can do it, you can be part of it or not and I think it's very important to start understanding that all these different aspects both legally both economically uh, socially and political are uh, images or projections which you have the right to inhabit or to own or to be a co-owner of and a co-producer and so that if that means taking back a house or property yes Okay, finalize it, um, because I think we have to move on. Uh, Andrea, you might have been frightened for a second that these three people were being over-instrumentalized and have now become puppets of the market and playing the game <laughs> on the market conditions, but no, I believe the, the answers by all three of you. Yes, I do. Uh, so, w they just prove that they are autonomous still and will be and will remain so and will redefine this whole uh, um, ownership question in ways like this whole conference is redefining the, the, the public and the social. So, I want to ask, uh, uh, thank uh, Sabrina and Jana and Roman. Thank you very much. Welcome.